we are in a public forum, so it's yeah. open. You know, I mean, it's a. Good. Good evening. I'd like to call the December 13th meeting of the Jackson County Board of Education to order. I'd like to welcome everyone um, to our last meeting, we believe, of 2021 uh, and before Christmas. So our, our first item uh, tonight is, is the pledge. We have uh, three, three leaders, three young girls from East Jackson Middle school, if they would make their way forward, uh, Miss Maddie Gooch, Emma Kate Holly, and Melanie Tidwell. So, if we'd stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. Would you girls mind introducing yourselves at the mic? I just said who you were, so now we can put names with faces and what grade you're in. Um, I'm Emma Kate, and I'm in seventh grade. I'm Maddie, and I'm also in seventh grade. I'm Melanie Tidwell, and I'm in seventh grade. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Our, our next item is a, uh, approval of our minutes. Uh, from our November 8th meeting. Do I have any corrections or additions to the minutes? Here, none. Do I have a motion to approve? So I have a motion. Do I have a second? So I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, it's unanimous. Our next item is a, a approval of the agenda. Um, all members had an opportunity to review the agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve it? No, no change. So I have a motion to approve the agenda. Do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion and a second. All in favor of the approval of the agenda as submitted. Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. So our next item uh, of the agenda is our superintendent's comments. Dr. Howard. Thank you, Mr. Clarice and board. I want to thank you for your time this afternoon, and we are very excited. Each month we get to celebrate and see highlights from one of our schools, and tonight we're honored to have Ms. Johnson and the East Jackson Middle School students here. Um, Ms. Johnson, I don't know if you want to come. I can play your video, and then you want to speak first. Great. So welcome, Ms. Johnson, principal at East Jackson Middle School, and thank you, ladies. You did a fine job with the pledge. I would like to ask Maddie and Emma Kate and Melanie to come back and let them tell you about one of our service projects at East Jackson. At EJMS, we care deeply for the families in our area. One of the many ways we express our pride in our community was through our Red Ribbon Week campaign. As a school, we sold links for our spirit chain. Each link represented our commitment. We raised $1,000 to contribute toward the Holiday Connection, which supports Christmas for families. They raised $1,000.25 at a time, so that was, um, we're very proud of them. And Mr. Clear, so you were right, these are, are some of our leaders and we're very proud of them. Thank you, ladies. It's been an interesting year at East Jackson Middle School, to say the least, but we are so proud and happy to be back to the business of teaching and learning. Um, it has been a, quite a ride, but we would like to now show a short video created by our news crew to sh highlight some of the things that have been happening at East Jackson Middle School. This video was created by our news crew and edited by Ashlyn Tucker and J.C. Trogdon. It gives you an idea of what's been going on.
Thank you, Ms. Johnson and East Jackson Middle School. That was a very professionally done video. Thank you. I'd like to be a student there, looking at the activities and things they're engaged in. So thank you, ladies, and thank you again, Ms. Johnson. Annually, we have the privilege of working with some of our highest performing, most passionate students at the high school level. And so one of our state's really cornerstones of, of achievement is the Governor's Honors Program. And so Jen Sain is going to share with us a little bit of the process and then who, where we are in celebrating these students. Well, good evening, Dr. Howard, and members of the board, and school and district leaders and community members. It's a pleasure to be here tonight to talk to you a little bit about the Governor's Honors Program. Annually, our schools get to nominate students that show outstanding work and passion in areas, individual areas that they're, they transcend the walls of the school. And these areas can go from anything such as reading and math and science to ag research to theater to dance and everything in between. There's a host of opportunities for our students to show their passion in those areas. And so for Governor's Honors, this is a four week summer residential program that they are vying for a spot to attend at Berry College. And this is eligible, our students that are eligible to compete for this is our rising juniors and seniors. So our current sophomores and juniors. And in um, Jackson County, we have um, created quite the system for our students to experience. When they are nominated at the school level, they come in and we bring them and immerse them into a whole day of lots of activities here with district leaders and support staff helping them. They get to take part in a collaborative performance tasks, they get to take part in mock interviews. We give them like a mini conference session that addresses things like professional etiquette, the governor's honors process, how to create a portfolio, and then we give them that mock interview experience where they get feedback from those mock interview judges. And they work with their mentors. They're dis everybody at the district has a student that they mentor, that they're an expert in that area. And so we help them prepare for that district level interview. So being nominated as a Governor's Honors candidate is truly something to be proud of. If you think about these stats, there's about 250,000 students across our state that's eligible for this competition. And the state has to narrow that down to three, about 3,400 kids. That's a big difference, right? And then the state has to narrow that down to 660 kids that actually get to attend Barry's summer Governor's Honors Program. And so just being a name in the mix of those numbers is something to be proud of. And I see some of our students back there and I'm so proud of you guys. So in Jackson County, we had 40 candidates nominated. They went through the district interview process. Our district judges outside of the county, we bring in a, a different panel of people, professionals in education and in the community. They have to narrow that 40 down to 15 names that go on to the next round of the competition. So those 15 students will be among that 3,400 interviewing for that next round of the competition. So I like to tell those stats because it really puts a glimpse into how prestigious just being a name in this pot is. And so as you can imagine, we're extremely proud of our students. And so tonight I want to recognize them. We do have a few here, but I want to shout out every one of our students. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go through our list. And if you're here, I do want you to come up and I will shake your hand if you want me to shake your hand and I will give you a certificate, okay? So I, the, these following people are the students that made it to our candidate list. So they interviewed at the district level. So we have Colby Choate from Jackson County High School, Leah Eubanks from East Jackson Comprehensive High School. We have Austin Frazier from Jackson County High School and representing Empower College and Career Center. We have Griffin Jones from Jackson County High School, 
Emma Kessler from East Jackson, Georgia Lance from Jackson County High School, Gavin Lee from Jackson County High School, Don Maney from East Jackson High School, Alex Martinez from Jackson County High School and representing Empower College and Career Center, John Marquez from Jackson County High School, Michaela McElwin from East Jackson High School, Mason McMenemy from Jackson County High School, Isaac Miller from East Jackson High School, Hayden Payne from Jackson County High School and representing Empower College and Career Center, Gabriel Purcell from East Jackson High School, Cameron Ramsey from East Jackson High School, Holly Smith from East Jackson High School, Taylor Spires from Jackson County High School, Sam Suarez from East Jackson High School, Bella Turco from East Jackson High School, Ava Wilbanks from Jackson County High School, and Luke Wiley from Jackson County High School. So the next group of students I want to introduce you to are the students that made it to that 15. So they've already advanced to the next round of the competition and are working on their applications, which are due January 3rd. So they've got a tight deadline. So help me um, recognize J.P. Aguilar Jimenez from Jackson County High School, Jacob Buell from East Jackson High School, Caitlin Dutton from Jackson County High School, Sarah Kate Giddens from East Jackson High School, Kennedy Habib from Jackson County High School, Amelia Hansen from Jackson County High School, Kellen Salome from Jackson County High School. Come on down, Kellen. I should have had somebody looking through this for me, Kellen. Here we are. Congratulations. Thank you so much. J.D. Smith from Jackson County High School, Jesse Stevens from East Jackson High School, Maggie Strickland from East Jackson Comprehensive High School and representing Empower College and Career Center, Carmen Tedipo from Jackson County High School, James Vogt from East Jackson Comprehensive High School and representing Empower College and Career Center, Cassidy Weed from Jackson County High School, Addie Wheeler from East Jackson Comprehensive High School, and Emma Wood from Jackson County High School and representing Empower College and Career Center. Come on up, Emma. So it wouldn't be possible if we didn't have the adults helping, right? So I want to give a shout out to our high school coordinators. I would like to recognize Ms. Shane Chason, counselor at East Jackson Comprehensive High School. She helps us coordinate for that, their school. I would also like to recognize Ms. Michelle Parker, um, AP capstone and history teacher from Jackson County High School and Ms. Judy Hollinsworth, AP and online instructor for Empower College and Career Center. I could not do this without them, so please help me congratulate and thank them. And finally, I want to thank our district leaders, our members of the teaching and learning team, our central office staff, and a host of Jackson County educators that helped me pull this off every year. Without them, this would not be possible. And we love every minute of it because we're all about our students and wanting to see them excel and get to brag on them. So thank you so much, board, for my time tonight. And congratulations again, students. Thank you, Ms. Sane, and congratulations to those outstanding students. And Ms. Sane, when do they find out if they're selected? Do we know the timeline for that? Is that in April? It's pretty, no, they have uh, two more rounds to go. 
Okay. So when they turn in their applications in, on January 3rd, they will find out shortly thereafter, and I'm sorry I don't have That's that okay. date, but it's like quick turnaround, and then they have the next round. So. Right. So, well, we wish you the best. Congratulations and good luck. I know it's not what you want to do over Christmas break, but you'll do a good job with it, right? Hopefully they'll get it done before break <laughs> yeah, so they there can you go. enjoy break. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. The next item on our agenda we host monthly is to recognize our mindset. Uh, Mr. Nicholson, I, I know that you have some that you probably want to recognize, especially tonight. So I'll turn it over to you. Sure, Dr. Harden. If you don't mind, just kind of a, as you typically do, scroll through. With 20 different represent, representatives each month, it's, it's hard to give everybody the time that they deserve. I want to thank our schools, though. They do a wonderful job of identifying each month a, a, an adult and a student who really are uh, exemplary in the particular mindset. This month, it's 100% accountable. And so I just I want you to know what that means and what, what these people are being recognized for. So there are four characteristics of 100% accountable, and one of them is owning your own life. And the, the concept there is that that you, you are the one that's in control of your life and you don't wanna be a victim of, of thinking that you're anything less than that and that you, you really begin by owning all aspects of your life and if you think about that in schools, whether that is a test performance, whether that is a, uh, an action, a, a misstep, something you said that you didn't mean, whatever it is, this goes all the way down to pre-K, all the way through our, our high school students. So owning your own life. The next one is overcoming limiting beliefs. And, and this, is a, this is one of those situations that we often say that we are our, our worst obstacles. If you ever think about a situation you've been in life and you think, but wait a second, I'm the one creating that problem. We can overcome these things. And so realizing that, that you can overcome your limiting beliefs and don't set those parameters on yourself. And so again, th you think about students all the way from pre-K to the time they graduate in high school as, as seniors, if they really believe these things, you know that these are gonna be the tenets that they can walk away with that'll help them to be incredibly successful. The uh, third one is focusing your energy. And really, this is, this is tied very closely to passion first. If you focus your energy on the things that you love to do, then you're going to get more out of what you're doing. And so this concept of making sure, you know, we, we all have the same number of hours in a day, so making sure that you're spending that time incredibly wisely and that you, you restructure your time in a way that allows you to be successful. And the fourth one is grow through life. Um, Mr. Gilbert and I were actually talking about being lifelong learners. He was explaining uh, that concept a little bit earlier and, uh, and in kind of a comical stance, but the idea here is that, that you learn and you grow all the way through life and that the, the, the whole point of this connected to 100% accountability is that there are good things that happen, there are bad things that happen, but you persevere and you make it. And so the, the concept of 100% accountable is, is wrapped up in these four different tenets. And Dr. Howard, if you don't mind kind of scrolling through, as you see the, the individuals from each school, the, the, the adults as well as the students, I want to call attention to two. Um, Sierra, Sierra Pitts and Empower really exudes the own your own life, uh, own your life and focusing your energy. Um, and really, you think about Empower, this concept of really focusing in on your passion and really leaning into that passion. And that's something that all of our schools do, but Empower has really been able to people do that a little bit more closely aligned to careers. Uh, so Sierra is, is definitely a highlight there. And then as we get a little further down, uh, Gum Springs Elementary just, uh, is highlighting Mr. Pete McClellan, and he is a bus driver. Um, one of the things he does is he writes a handwritten note to all of his students on their birthday. Um, but when, when you really get to know him, um, he really, what he does is he helps his riders to overcome their limiting beliefs to be able to make sure that they are truly being accountable for their actions and that they're also growing through life. And so um, each one of these individuals gets recognized at the school. They get a little token of, of recognition uh, thanks to Chick-fil-A. Um, they get posted on social media. But most importantly, they have a positive impact on the people around them. So um, thank you for our schools, but, but also thank you for each of these individuals for being 100% accountable. Thank you so much, Mr. Nicholson. I just wanted to finish flipping through so the board could see. Excellent. How about that, Mr. Pete? He's something else, isn't he? <laughs> Been driving for us a while. We're very grateful. Great students as well. 
All right. The next item that I'd like to um, ask of our high school leaders, Dr. Blackburn, Mr. Wester, and Ms. Palmer, I'm not sure who all might be coming forward, but um, as you are fully aware, we have been in uh, somewhat of a evolutionary state with bringing on um, the new high school and bringing on Empower this year. And so our high school leaders have worked diligently to evaluate our students opportunities and what we want to do going forward uh, to make sure that they have as many options as possible. So I'm going to pull up your slide deck and turn it over to you all. Thank you all for being here. Should have gotten me a stool. So thank you for having us here. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about the high school schedule um, presentation for next year. It's a four by four block schedule. Um, Four by four is exactly, so we start our slides with what is a four by four block? It is exactly what it sounds like. Students take four classes first semester and four classes second semester. So in December, they will finish four classes first semester and their grades will be posted. Then they will begin new classes in January and take those classes for the next 90 days and finish them in May. The class length is the same, so the number of minutes that they're getting currently in our classes will not change, um, and the number of days is the same. It's just the dynamic of how it's laid out in the schedule, and I'm gonna allow Mr. Wester to talk about why that is a good thing. You can raise that back up. Maybe just a little bit. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as we've talked with, with our students uh, over the past few years, uh, the, the seven period day has been a source of stress for many of them. Uh, and having seven classes to carry throughout the year at the same time uh, puts them in, in stressful situations throughout the year, especially when assessments are coming around and those kind of things. And so uh, one of the things that we looked at to try to alleviate that would be to take a little of that load off of them uh, in terms of everything being all at once. And so by going to a four by four, it allows them to focus on four classes at a time as opposed to seven throughout the year. Uh, we believe that'll be a great advantage to many of our students in terms of being able to focus on uh, four classes at a time and with two of those typically being academic courses and two of those being elective courses and being able to uh, kind of uh, focus for a concentrated period of time on two areas of academics and then in the spring the other two. So we think that could be a great benefit to them. Um, it also gives us some flexibility for our students who do struggle where we can provide them with year-long instruction, daily instruction as opposed to now where that's every other day. Uh, but also for students who struggle in the first semester, we can then uh, allow them that opportunity in the second semester to get those credits that right now on a year-long course, uh, we really struggle to help them uh, really to make up for credits they don't get over the course of a year. We could actually uh, put them in that course again in the spring, allow them then to possibly get credits that uh, right now we can't do because of the year-long structure that we have. Uh, in addition, uh, what we're looking at is, is putting the vast majority of our courses in the 4x4, but we don't have to put all courses in the 4x4, and we don't have to do that for each of our kids. So we do have flexibility within this where those courses or for those students that need it, we can place them in courses that are year-long and provide actually extra support for kids that struggle in particular areas such as math, for example. We can actually make it a, a full year course as opposed to making it a, just a semester course for those kids if that's what works best for that particular group or that individual student. Um, and we can modify uh, the schedule for those kids uh, and provide them with the greatest amount of flexibility to meet their individual needs. We're really excited about that opportunity. So uh, the idea of giving our kids you know, eight credits a year is also something that we're excited because it will open up greater opportunities for them uh, in electives uh, to get uh, pathways completed uh, to be able to do work-based learning and dual enrollment uh, and also making sure that uh, you know we're providing them with the support they need for those students who need extra support. So we, feel like we believe this is the best option uh, for the students in Jackson County uh, to get the most out of their opportunity at our high schools. Good evening. Um, I have about 15 plus years of scheduling experience at the high school and I think Mary has maybe at least that much, maybe more. And one of the things that I've come to realize is there is no perfect high school schedule. Um, you know, we're scheduling for 13, almost 1400 and Jason's scheduling for 16 or 1700 or maybe 2500, I don't know, by the time <laughs> next year starts. We do believe though that the four by four, that base schedule is the best schedule for the majority of our students. And as Mr. Wester mentioned, um, we want to have the flexibility flexibility to kind of run a what we call a modified block. So if there are students or groups of students that would function better on a different type of schedule, we can do that. So for example, I know a lot of folks have been concerned about math. 
Most of our math students will be just fine on the traditional four by four. But for example, with our um, algebra one support kids, our kids that need a little more support, this schedule allows us the flexibility to put those students either in a skinny year long or on an AB rotating block with their math and their math support classes. So what we're doing as we go through the process of registration is looking at those co cohorts of kids and developing a, a specialized schedule for them if that's what's best for them. Um, keep in mind too that this year students have taken eight courses, but one of those courses was their TAA advisement. And although we still believe that is important, we will shorten that time frame next year. And then that allows students one additional option for courses. So I know we've had some folks that were concerned about, well, if I have a band student or a course student or a student who's an athlete that wants to take weight training all year, will they have that option? Remember they're gaining an additional course. So we do believe that those students will be able to pick up those additional um, courses in areas that they are particularly interested in. So again, the high school group here d does believe that the four by four block is the best base schedule for us to run next year, um, best for our students to alleviate some of the stress that Mr. Wester mentioned, um, and also best for our teachers too. Thank you. I'm, can we ask, can we ask questions? Um, no. no? <laughs> I know you didn't mean that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, just, just a couple real quick, and I don't, I don't want to monopolize the uh, question asking, but um, what's the break? Is it at Christmas? So we. It is. Okay. Yep. Um, my, my other questions revolve around um, math. Yep. So, can you explain to me what a what is a math support class? So for students who qualify for math support, these are students who have um, demonstrated that they need extra assistance. The state offers Algebra One, Algebra One support as separate credits. So Algebra One support is an elective credit in the core academic. So it is a HOPE eligible course, but it is an elective course. So our students who need that support can take both Algebra One, which is the required credit, and then the Algebra One support to give them extra time with the material. Material. So they, if we do this on, let's say we do it on an A-B block, they may have Algebra 1 on A-Day and Algebra 1 support on B-Day, so they access the material on A-Day and then they are retaught and they are given more support and more time to practice on the B-Day. So the Algebra support is designed to give them more access to the content so that they can show success. It is also offered in Geometry and in Algebra 2. And that's during the time that they have the algebra class that part of the year. What about the? No, they would get two full so credits. Two, two. credits. Okay. It would okay. take two blocks for that, full, one block for the entire year. So the, the support class, and I hate to, I, I've been asked a lot of these questions, uh -huh. and I promised some folks I would ask tonight, and they're, that's why we were waiting on the live feed. I've got a handful of folks that were wanting to, that wanted to hear this. Um, so the, the support class, as I understand it, it may be for someone that is struggling, but maybe it's a B student that their parents, um, maybe Brooklyn Clarcy, who gets pounded by her dad, that she needs to have an A. Is that, is that what a support class would, would be for? Typically, the entire semester course would not be that, but we would be able to provide tutoring and support for any of our students in the semester long courses that were traditionally stronger students but just needed some help. We, we, we will have an advisement period every day that will be a 30 minute period but which, which, in which we can provide support for all of our students who may not need a full year's worth of extra credit in that course to get the support but who may struggle with a particular concept or to get that grade bumped up you know, from a B to an A, that type of thing. We will be able to support those students on a daily basis uh, through the advisement period and the remediation and support period that is built into the schedule that we will have for all of our students. Does, does this allow students as they, when they advance to junior and senior level if, if maybe they didn't take a class as a freshman or sophomore, it would enable them to, to take two maths in one year? Does that? Absolutely, if that's what was needed for their schedule. We have a lot of flexibility with this type of a schedule to catch kids up or to pick up something that they find an interest in later on that they weren't able to do necessarily earlier in their career. Absolutely, I think there's a lot of flexibility with this type of a schedule that right now when you place them in seven courses for the year, there's really not a lot of room to change that unless you absolutely have to and that becomes more of an emergency situation as opposed to a choice. And this works well with the Empower offerings?
demand and for it. So is that going to be an AB flexible schedule type thing too? It could be, Ms. Wheeler, or some of our students may actually just want to take a full 90-minute block of band first semester and a full 90-minute block of band second semester, and the schedule will allow them to do that as well. Again, remembering that they're losing that one full 90-minute block of TAA, and so they can gain an, a course in an interest area for them. So what we'll do as we go through the registration process is we'll look at those cohorts of kids, and for example, with, with chorus, it may be necessary for us to do so a, a, a full 90 minute block first semester and second semester but with some kids we may, we may want to skinny it so they take it one block all year and so uh, definitely have a focus on protecting those fine arts programs because we know how important they are mm -hmm. and our coaches with the weight training as well because they're very adamant about that being something that they would like to see year round as well mm -hmm. okay. I have yes um, We actually are on a block now, but it's a, it's a year-long A-B block. Okay. So our students rotate every other day uh, with a four block, and it's a seven-period schedule, though, with advisement being one of our four blocks every other day. When you said seven, the Ohio school principal yes, said 50 minutes, and then you talked about 90. <laughs> Correct. Yep. So, so we we took the the seven period day and we broke it into every other day with a a block of advisement being one of the blocks. You're doing an AB now. We are, yes, sir. Uh, I just I heard seven period day. Sure. Yeah. Which when we transitioned to the AB two years ago from a seven period day at the high school level, and that was to try to get us ready to be more in line with what Empower was going to need, which was the block. The extra personnel necessary to do. Some of it, yes, sir. Some of it. So we we may need a, we need a few more. We'll see. Yeah. I think we will. Yeah. And, I, and I appreciate that. that. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I would. I It can be, it can be yeah. uh, you know, an obstacle. For the teachers, too, because you, you have to just stick right by the time the whole time. So. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. What, one, one last um, uh, one last question, and it just escaped me. Uh, Carol put me under pressure, and I plumb forgot. Um, <laughs> the, the one question I, I have received is if we, if we transition to this, will it reduce any downtime that we may have, the students may have in transition from Empower back to the high school. I, I have received some some comments that I feel like there is some kids are in, in some type of dead time during the day. I don't know. I, I haven't received that from, from my child, but I've heard that from some parents, so I have a question. Well, that, that downtime now uh, leads us into a period that is an extension of the advisement period. Um, that transition now will happen during the advisement period, so it will actually, yes, it will limit some of the downtime, especially for our students who are not traveling. And I think a lot of those folks are experiencing some downtime um, in our, what we call Panther Prep, and you guys may call uh, TAA. TAA, but that TAA period now is 90 minutes. And every day we have the transition period, which is about 25 minutes. So it can be an extended period of time at this time. That, that will no longer be the case because the 90 minutes will be a course, but we'll have a 30 minute period that is the advisement period, which will also serve as some of that transition time. So it will bring that time down considerably. I would just remind the board too, Ms. Wheeler has been on the board for quite some time and Ms. Palmer and I did, we transitioned from lock schedule when economic challenges forced us to be more efficient at the high school. We had a very successful experience with block scheduling for years at our high school level. Um, and so I'm very confident. It does require some professional learning and that will be ongoing work that needs to happen. But in terms of the experience for our students, I'm very confident that this is gonna be a, a, an improved experience and I'm glad we're able to be able to transition to it so thank you any more questions for the board or from the board for thank y'all so much for being here it means a lot for um, them to be able to hear from you you guys have been in the trenches working and making it happen and we are grateful very we have amazing leaders we really 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 are fortunate so thank y'all oh.
right. Um, the last item is just a reminder for our board that our next meeting will be a work session. It will be on January the 6th. That's Thursday after we return from our break. Um, and we have been uh, honored to meet at Empower again. Since we're going to have our Parent Advisory Council, we thought it would be better to do that at Empower. So our work session on January the 6th will be held at Empower. So if you can just mark your calendars and make sure that's on your calendar. And at 7 o'clock, immediately following the work session, we will have our Parent Advisory Committee. Um, and I've already heard back from about 15 of those who are confirmed to be there. So I'm looking forward to that evening. And I know folks are looking forward to some updates um, on, on our facilities planning. So that's all we have at this time. Dr. Howard, thank you. Um, next up on our agenda is our is our time for for public comment. We have at the beginning of the meeting we had no one signed up from outside. Do we have anyone here wishing to um, address the board? Seeing none, we will we will move on to our action items. Our first item uh, for action is uh, election of a, of a board chairman. We will. Be, I'll be more than happy to entertain a motion at this time. I move we uh, nominate Don Tracy as our board chairman. So we have a motion from Mr. Johnson. We have a second, second. from from Miss Anglin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I guess that's unanimous. We will <laughs> we'll move on to the next item: is uh, election of a of a vice chair. Do I have a motion? Or, uh, or nomination for uh, vice chair. I recommend Lynn Wheeler. So I, vice chair. So I have a motion for Miss Anglin to nominate Miss Wheeler as vice chair for 2022. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second from Mr. Hollett and Mr. Johnson. I'm not going to split that up. So um, if you could put that in the minutes, please, that would be great. Uh, all, all in favor of uh, Miss Wheeler being vice chair for 2022? Aye. 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 That'd be unanimous. Our next item, uh, next agenda items are our consent agenda. Uh, we have discussed these as we always do at our work session. Um, any member wishing at this time to, to remove any of those items from the consent? Hearing none, uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So I have a motion. How about a second? second? So I have a motion and a second. All in favor? That's unanimous. Our next item is executive session. So we do have executive session for the purpose of personnel, uh, specifically the um, superintendent's evaluation. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? So I have a motion. A second? second? So I have a motion and a second. All in favor to go into executive session? Aye. Aye. That would be unanimous. We're going to take a short recess and go to executive session.
good. Okay, we have returned from our executive session. Uh, we'll entertain a motion to come out of the executive session. So I have a motion. Do I have a second? So I have a motion and a second. All in favor of coming out of the executive session? That would be unanimous. Uh, we do have action that uh, came from executive session. We um, completed Dr. Howard's evaluation and it was satisfactory. Um, at, at this time, I do have one other item that we failed to mention as I speedily ran through the consent agenda. Um, so this is my fault. We would like to recognize uh, Troy Johnson. Um, so we are moving him from interim uh, principal uh, at North Jackson to full-time principal, is that official? Um, <laughs> thank you, Troy. And w we have one other um, uh, announcement. That would be Miss Lisa Ellis from interim principal at Gum Springs to permanent uh, principal at Gum Springs. That would be my elementary school. Thank you. Any, without any uh, further business, we stand adjourned. Thank you.